Faith cannot take a day off. If we take a break in our prayer, we take a break in faith. If we take a break in faith, we have a break with God. And that is catastrophic. A break in God is how the enemy infiltrates us. A break in God is how the enemy puts things into our lives that wouldn't ordinarily get to be there. We cannot afford to have a day off from faith. We cannot afford to take a day off from prayer. We cannot afford to take a day off from standing in our authority in Christ. The government is not the number one thing responsible for the promises we have in our nation today. The church is. The church is responsible because many churches have had a day off in prayer. They've had a day off in faith. They've had a break with God and they were powerless to stop the agenda of the enemy. So I want to give you a message of hope today but also a message of stirring, to stir up that fire that is within you, to stir up that gift and calling of God which is upon you, to lead you into a life of constant, consistent victory. We are called to be people of prayer. Prayerful people have God realized as an actual force in their life. A praying church has God realized as a glorious church. But what gives the church its glory is the work of God, the word of God, and relationship built through prayer in God. No man or woman is greater than their prayer life. I asked you a question yesterday. Have you prayed today? Many times you can ask that kind of question in a church or a Christian setting. Have you prayed today? Some of you would say, yeah, we were at the pre-service prayer. Yeah, we prayed for our families just a moment ago. That's prayer. Very good if you've prayed. But the more important question than have you prayed today is do you have a prayer life? A prayer life is the thing I'm talking about that doesn't take a day off. A prayer life is the thing I'm speaking about which doesn't have moments. Paul encouraged us to pray at all times with all kinds of prayer. He even went as far as saying pray without ceasing. That is a lifestyle of prayer. Our lifestyle of prayer isn't just for moments when we get on the stage, isn't just for moments when we come to the altar, isn't just for moments. Our lifetime prepares us for that moment because the only preparation there is for real prayer is a holy life. The person that doesn't have time for prayer doesn't have time for a holy life. And in the same way, the person that doesn't have time for a holy life doesn't have time for prayer. This is a call back to prayer. Some of you might say, well, tell us then, how do we pray? Jesus was asked the same question in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. And many of us are familiar with verse 9 and verse 10. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fantastic. That's a great prayer. But the power in the Lord's prayer comes not in the saying of the words, but in the pattern of thinking in which our mind is formed. I want you to get that, so I'm going to say it again. The power in the Lord's prayer comes not in the saying, our Father, our Father, our Father who art in heaven. It's not in how many times you say it. It's not in how energetically you say, Our Father who art in heaven. No, that doesn't make the prayer more powerful. It's not in the saying. It's in the praying of the prayer. The heart of prayer is to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The purpose of prayer is to bring the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It happens through you while you pray. God is not looking for better methods. God is not looking for better machinery. God is not looking for better plans or better platforms. He is looking for people who will pray. Are you one of them? Are you one of the praying people today? I can't see any hands up. Hallelujah. So that will bring me to the title of today's message. 
bring heaven to earth. We're taking it from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 10. Oh, I'll go from verse 9. And I'm going to read it to you in the Passion Translation. I want you to see things from a slightly different perspective than you might be uh, familiar with. There is no need to imitate them since your Father already knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. I wish they taught me it like that in school. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is in heaven. Doesn't that make it just that little bit more clear? The purpose of our prayer is to manifest the kingdom of heaven. The purpose of our prayer is to cause every purpose of God to be fulfilled in the earth. This is the challenge to us today. What is the will of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Let's find out. I'm going to take you, first of all, to the book of John 6, verse 30. We'll read through some scriptures to let you know where I'm going, and then I'll tell you about them. John 6, and we're going for verse 40. Are you there with me? John 6, verse 40. For the long of my Father, the will of my Father, is that everyone who embraces the Son and believes in Him will experience eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. So our prayer is to bring this will of God to pass in our lives, in our family, in our community, in our nation, everywhere we go. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, that's the will of God. What's the kingdom of heaven that we're supposed to bring to pass? Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, and we're going to take verse 17 and 18. Now then, Oh, I'm in 15. No wonder that doesn't look right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now then, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but the kingdom of God is the realm of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. Serving the anointed one, Jesus, by walking in these kingdom realities pleases God and earns the respect of others. So when we humble ourselves and pray according to this understanding, we bring heaven to earth. What you can see happening in society today does not look like heaven even looked at earth. Talk less of came to earth. What we see in society is the complete opposite of the will of God and the complete opposite of the kingdom of God. What you can see, therefore, is that we are actually in a warfare. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. And the essence of spiritual warfare is that there are two kingdoms trying to manifest themselves on the earth through mankind. The book of Psalms says, For the earth God has given unto men. Therefore men are the legal right. Men and women are those that have legal right to bring manifestation on the earth, to bring things to happen on the earth. Demons can't just make it bad. They have to get someone to agree with them. Demons can't just do evil. They need someone to do evil through. In the same way, God is looking for someone who will partner with him. God is looking for someone who will agree with him, who will open themselves up and say, Lord, use me as a channel for your will to be done today. Use me as a channel for your purpose to be done in my office, in my workplace today. Use me as a channel wherever I go. Let me be showing your light. Let me be diffusing the fragrance of God himself. What are you manifesting in your walk? What are you permitting to come to earth in your daily life? Are you sure you are manifesting the kingdom of God in your conversation? Are you manifesting the kingdom of God in your relationship with people? Are you bringing God's will to pass in how you behave? Or are you giving an opportunity for the other kingdom? The kingdom of hell manifests through pride through anger, and through offense. This is why Jesus ended the Lord's Prayer by saying, but if you hold anything against anyone, 
forgive them. Father, forgive me my sin as I forgive those who sin against me. He made it known, look, I've taught, I'm teaching you how to bring God's kingdom to pass on the earth. I'm teaching you how to walk in the spirit and in truth. But there's one big key that changes it, and that is offense, pride, and anger. The kingdom of heaven on the other side manifests itself through faith, through prayer, and through believing. Do we have any believers in the house today? I hope this message is encouraging you because I believe you're going to go from here and you're going to be light as light should be. There are some lights, you know, that they, they need a touch. They need to be twisted in f firmer. They need to be turned up a bit. There are some fires which you look at and you're like, that's a fire, but there's not really any heat coming from it. I don't believe I'm talking to cold fires today. I don't think I'm talking to show fires today. I think I'm talking to raging fires. Is that right? No. Turn with me again. I've got so many scriptures for you today, you're going to be loaded. 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 14. My mentor used to teach me that the word of God is spoken to every one of you every time. One word may speak today, another may speak tomorrow, but God has sent his word into your life. This is why we need to read the Bible. You might have said, oh, I've read the book of Mark, I've read the book of Luke, I've read the book of John before. Yes, and there's something that was for you that time you read it. The next time you read it, come with a clean slate, come with openness and hunger for it, and God will show you something you've never seen before. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. God always makes his grace visible in Christ, who includes us as partners of his endless triumph. Through our yielded lives, if you underline in your Bible, you can underline that word yielded lives. I don't like to underline, but some do. Through our yielded lives, he spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere we go. We have become the unmistakable aroma of the victory of Jesus to God, a perfume of life to those being saved and the odor of death to those who are perishing. So just take that. The key I want you to get is through our, our yielded lives, Jesus spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere we go. That is the purpose of God. That is the will of God. That is the kingdom of God. Wherever you go, if a fire went through the place you went through, you would see. If a tornado tore through a place, you would see the result. You would see things scattered. You would see evidence that a, a wind has been here. A fire has been here. A light has been here. A hammer has been here. A sword has been here. Water has been here. There must be evidence of the Word of God in your life as a Christian. If you claim you have been given your life to God and you've spent time in the Word, you've accepted the Word of God as the truth, what is the evidence of the hammer of God in your life? What is the evidence of God's fire and God's flame? If it's possible for you to read the Word of God and not be set on fire, it means there's something wrong. Either you didn't really read the Word or the Word of God's not true. The problem comes many times, not in the form, but in the heart behind it. Not in the form, but the heart behind it, the reason behind it, the motive behind it. For us to diffuse the fragrance of God everywhere we go, it requires the heat of prayer. I was joking with some people um, uh, I think it was last month or so, saying that in the Old Testament, you could see that God was much more of a barbecue lover than he was uh, in the New Testament in the way that he always asked for burnt offerings, sacrifices by this, sacrifices by that. Uh, so I know he'd get on really well with some people. But in today, we are transformed from that Old Testament style of having to offer a physical sacrifice to becoming living sacrifices. The book of Romans 12, verse 1 to 2 says, Offer your bodies to God, therefore, as living sacrifices unto the Lord. 
Now, the interesting thing about a living sacrifice in the Old Testament was sometimes they were also offered with incense. And incense takes a lot of preparation. You've got to do a lot of mixing, a lot of stirring. It, it took a job. It wasn't something a lazy person could do to get incense. It took work. But no matter how much work you put into that incense, it did nothing until there was heat. It did nothing until there was fire attached to it. Prayer can be likened to incense and is likened many times throughout the Scriptures. Oh, that prayer rises to God like incense. For your prayer to rise to God like incense, there must be fire in that prayer. Your prayer might be low-turned, low-volumed, but it cannot be with low heat. Yeah. Hannah prayed a silent prayer, a mumbling prayer. And, and the priest thought she was drunk. It might be a low voice. It might not be clear to people around you. But if it's clear to God, that is what matters. When you pray, you'll hear yourself. If you pray to some degree of volume, people around you will hear you. But for God to hear, He only hears the effective, fervent prayer of a heart on fire for His kingdom. I'm not saying, oh, so you should give up on prayer then if your heart is not on fire and you're not fervent and you're not. What I'm telling you is if there has been an experience of prayer not working in your life, this might be why. If there has been unanswered prayer that you just can't explain why or how could this happen, stop looking around the circumstances. Stop looking around if God wanted to or if God did not want to. God wants to intervene in your life, but He'll only do it through you you have to give him permission. You have to invite him in. You have to say, this is yours. I laid on the altar as a sacrifice. Now send your fire like you did for Elijah. <laughs> David lived the same way in the book of Psalms chapter 5. He said, I put the pieces of my life on the altar and I wait for your fire. That is the heart of someone who has surrendered to God, who knows that my own way is not enough. My own understanding is not enough to lean on. I need the understanding of God. I need the ability of God. I need the power of God in my day-to-day -day life. Some of us, we believe we only need God in certain circumstances. To say it bluntly, because of our limitations in the things of the Spirit, we don't know how much we need God. If we knew how much we need Him and how much grace we are living by and enjoying every day, we would be more fervent in our petitions and in our staying in His presence. As living sacrifices, we need to be set on fire from heaven to release the fragrance of God and bring his kingdom with us wherever we go. People should be able to notice in your workplace that there's something about you. There's a heat, there's a warmth, there's a glow, there's a glory. This comes by fire. It doesn't come by chance. This fire brings manifestation. Like I said, either you're set on fire by hell, like the book of James chapter 3 talks about, that the tongue is a great evil. Let's go there. James chapter 3. I, th I don't think Pastor James would be invited to many churches today, the way he preached. So James chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 6. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. Just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze. And the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum of total wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. It corrupts the entire body and is set on fire by hell. It releases fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty strong words. But like I said, there are two kingdoms. Either your tongue is set on fire by hell because you lack self-control, you give in to pride, you, are, you permit anger, and you have offense in your heart. 
The other way is to be set on fire by God. Like we read in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, where he went to heaven and said, Woe is me, I'm undone, for my eyes have beheld the king. And a cherubim came with a flaming tongue from the altar and touched his lips and said, Behold, your sin is clean, is purged and your lips are clean. We can be set on fire by God in the same way. Jeremiah said, oh Lord, I've spoken to so many people on your name. They keep ignoring me. They keep doubting me. They keep persecuting me for your word. So I won't speak in your name anymore. And yet, as he tried to stop, he said, is not my word like a fire and a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? The fire of God was shut up in the bones of Jeremiah and he was wearied at trying to hold it in. Indeed, he could not. This is the kind of yearning God Almighty has for you. When you read his word and when you pray, he will put his purpose of the kingdom of heaven inside you and you won't be able to hold your tongue when you get near the unsaved. You won't be able to hold your peace when you see darkness happening in your city or in your state. You won't be able to hold back and say, oh no, I won't speak in the name of God. I won't take it. I won't change the situation. Fire is meant to burn something. Jesus himself said, you don't take a lamp and put it on and, and cover it. You put a lamp on a stand so everyone can see. Unless your lamp is switched off, you should all be placed somewhere for the Lord to see. You should all be placed somewhere by God for people to see. I want to turn that on its head. You have been placed by God somewhere that people are looking to you for what to do, for what to happen next, for what to come, and for an example. Whether or not you realize it, the whole world is watching you because you call yourself a child of God and they want to know what's the difference. What's the difference between you and what's happened to you and what happened to my brother or sister? What's the difference between what happened to you and what happened to my cousin, my colleague, my friend? It doesn't mean that Christians don't go through hard times. We do. But we come out of fire refined by gold, like gold. We don't build with straw and hay and stubble and whatever we do gets destroyed by the test. We come out of the test better than we went into it. That is the result of a Christian who's on fire for God. God has often revealed himself in the scripture as a fire. Hebrews 12 says our God is a consuming fire. In order to stand any circumstance or situation of life, we must learn how to keep God burning hot on the inside of us. This is where prayer comes into it. How do we pray? The Lord's Prayer is good enough. If you're looking for words to pray, like I said, it's not the most important thing about the Lord's Prayer isn't the words you say. It's the way you pray it. It's the heart you put into it. God clearly understands the language of sighs, the language of murmurs, the language of groaning. It's not about, did I find the perfect words to entice God into my situation? It's, did I show him a hungry heart that's seeking for him no matter what and isn't going to stop like the persistent widow knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking until the door of heaven is opened. Turn with me to Romans 8. Verse 26 to 27. In case you're saying, well, that still doesn't help me much. I don't understand how to pray by that. Okay, good. Romans 8 from verse 26. And in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray. How many can familiarize themselves with that? We don't even know how to pray sometimes. Or we don't know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. Praise God for the Holy Spirit, somebody. God. Yeah, we can clap for the Lord. That's a good idea. <laughs> Amen. 
God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, to perfect in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. What a God. So, the best way to pray is not to pray by yourself is to ask the Holy Spirit, pray through me. I give you my body, I give you my mouth, I give you my desires, now pray through me. And if you've never done it before, try it today. Come into the presence of God by faith and declare it. Whether you feel it or not, just say, Lord, I'm just doing it because the preacher told me to. (laughs) If you start in that form, but you start genuinely, the Lord will not despise it. Jesus did not turn Nicodemus away for coming at night because he had a genuine interest or desire to know about the kingdom of God. In the same way, if you say, Lord, I'm in a weak form. I don't know how to go about it. I'm just going to try what they said and see if it works. Give him a chance to prove he is real to you once and he will do it a million times. Lord, I'm just here. I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I don't know what to ask for. But he said, I should tell you, here's my mouth. Here's my heart. Download your message. Download your will and pray it out through me. Let the will of God be done. And then whatever the next thought he puts in your heart, speak it out by faith. And brother, sister, you have begun to pray. I guarantee the moment you start and you start to see the peace that comes, you start to see the joy that comes when you really start praying and trusting God for the answer, there is a difference. You begin to receive the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven in your life first. What do I mean by the kingdom of heaven? Turn with me maybe to the last scripture. We'll see. I might have another five. We'll go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to take uh, verse 19 through to 23 and then go back to verse 1. Galatians 5 from verse 19. The cravings of the self-life are obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessing of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit, or in other words, not manifest the kingdom of God? But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows. Can someone say that with me? Joy that overflows. Say this with me. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A life full of goodness. Faith that prevails gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Never set any law above these qualities for they are meant to be limitless. Hallelujah. That is the kingdom of God we're supposed to manifest in our daily life. Are you manifesting joy to that degree? Are you manifesting peace to that degree? There's a difference between man's kind and God's kind. Man's kind of peace doesn't obey the last verse of that scripture that says, these are meant to be without limit. When we have peace by man's ability, not by allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through or manifest through us, our peace can only go up to a level until our pride is injured and then you're not worthy of my peace anymore. 
our kindness will only go on some extent to some point until we get tired. Oh, I've done enough good works today. God will bless me for it. I can't do one more. Your patience, if it is man's type of patience, will not be enough to handle the difficulties and situations that you face in life. Your love will not be enough to see beyond the hatred of the enemy if it is not God's kind of love, if it is not a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. How you get this is through prayer. Are you lacking in any form of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Pray more. The world would be a better place if there was more prayer. Imagine if the fervor and passion of the church of the apostles had carried on and not diminished through the ages. Imagine where we would be today. Here we are still trying to get back to the level the apostles moved at. Here we are trying to get back to the level of relationship the prophets spoke of. And yet here we are in a place with better promises through the blood of Jesus. There is no limitation set on you by God. No one in heaven is thinking, oh no, God, remember you and me, we have a covenant, right? They can't do better than me. They can't pray more than I did. Even Apostle Paul bragged to the church, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you do. But he didn't say that as a means of that's a me and God thing and no one else is going to do that. He said that as a challenge. Oh, you think you speak in tongues? Bring it. <laughs> My point in this is that we are not supposed to yield only on our own strength and understanding. We are supposed to yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit because only He can give us His fruit without limit. Only He can give us the strength to endure when difficulty and hard times come. Only He can give us the humility to go above our pride and let the Lord elevate us. The Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's not someone who pretends to be humble. That's not someone who only tries to be humble. That is someone who manifests humility. Someone who brings heaven to earth shows themselves to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Someone who brings a life of fire wherever they go shows themselves to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you are walking in the will of God and in the kingdom of heaven on earth, you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean, the influence of the Holy Spirit? That is you are yielding to Him as we read in the Scripture and allowing Him to manifest His will. A lot of the time we get ourselves in a circumstance and because we have so much experience, we lean on our own experience of how to handle things and it stops us from yielding to God. Oh, I've handled this for years. I know exactly what I'm doing. I don't need that anyone teach me. You know better than God. This is just another one of those circumstances that come in business. I am more than able to handle this by yourself. Don't let your past experiences tempt you to give way to pride and miss out the refreshing the Holy Spirit would bring. He wants to renew your strength to go beyond what you could ordinarily do. He wants to empower you to do better than your best, but you have to yield to him and it will always be a choice. Now, I might have said that might have been the last scripture, but I guess I'm going on to another. We're going to Romans chapter 6. Are we blessed today? Yes. Are we being fed right now? Yes. Are we being ignited? Yes. Are we being lit up? Yes. Hallelujah. Romans 6 from verse 12. Sin is a dethroned monarch. A monarch is a king, a queen, a ruler. So you must no longer give it an opportunity to rule over your life, controlling how you live and compelling you to obey its desires and cravings. This is exactly what we're talking about. We have been allowing sin to manifest in our lives. 
So then, refuse to answer the call of sin to surrender your body as a tool for wickedness. Instead, passionately answer God's call to keep yielding your body to Him as one who has now experienced resurrection life. Anyone here experienced resurrection life? then it's time for the kingdom of heaven to manifest through you. It's time for the will of God to be done in your life and through you to the will of others, to the lives of others. You live now for His pleasure, ready to be used for the noble purpose of God. Remember this, sin will not conquer you, for God already has. You are not governed by the law, but governed by the reign of the grace of God. What are we to do then? Should we sin to our heart's content since there's no law to condemn us anymore? What a terrible thought. Verse 16, and here comes the crunch. Don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your own master? But choose carefully. For if you surrender yourself to become a servant, you are bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master and it will own you and reward you with death. But if you choose to love and obey God, he will lead you into perfect righteousness. You are a slave of whatever you choose to yield yourself to. That's one very important, very powerful, and very encouraging thing. The devil and sin do not have the power to make the choice for you. God Almighty, who has the power, doesn't use the power to make your choice for you either. He gives you free will. And that is a grace no one can take from you. So no matter where you find yourself, if you find yourself at your expectation, above it or below it, you will always have a choice how to behave in that circumstance. So when you can't control where you are, what you're doing or how you're feeling, you can still control how you respond to it. Manifest heaven. Choose to manifest love. Choose to manifest goodness. Choose to manifest patience. Choose to manifest humility. Choose to manifest self-control in your circumstance. You don't always have to be first. You don't always have to have the last word. You don't always have to be right. You're usually not. (laughs) Especially if you're anything like me. We depend on God's strength. We must lay ourselves under his hand for strength and renewal. Lastly, I want to come to the end of the message. I told you Galatians 5 verse 1, and I believe this is for everyone here. Let me be clear. Jesus, the anointed one, has set us free. Speaking to anyone here? Jesus, the anointed one, has set us free. Not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back to the bondage of our past. To bring heaven to earth, you must refuse to go back to your past. To stay on fire for God, any doubt must be resolutely resisted and steadfastly refused. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. (laughs) Ask them, did you hear what he said? He said, (laughs) I want you to repeat with me. He He said, if you want... To stay on fire for God, no matter what, you need to refuse doubt and resist doubt. That's it.